Hello, everyone. This is Shane Gibson with Rackin, and we are starting version 44 of the meetup. Uh, first, I have to apologize. I'm in a copy shop with a lot of background noise, so I will try and mute myself as much as possible. Uh, today, we're going to talk about context and workflows. A pretty amazing uh, feature that's been added into the Digital Rebar platform. Uh, last uh, meetup, version 43, we talked about profile and profile. Uh, validation content, uh, the VMware ESXi agent, and ARM conversation. So we had a lot of great stuff last week. We've only got the one topic lined up today, but it's a pretty important, pretty cool, exciting new feature for the platform. Uh, most of the uh, physical work, uh, physical work, typically typing, I guess, was done uh, in-house with uh, Victor Lowther. Um, context is sort of an interesting concept that has been kicked around in a number of different forms in the past. Um, I'll let uh, Greg kick off and talk about sort of the evolution of context, starting with uh, foot gun, uh, hang loose, and danger zone, and all kinds of other crazy names we've had for it in the past. And then uh, Victor can talk a little bit about the implementation and details. And I think Victor has a demo lined up for us today, so we're going to see context in operation. Um, Greg, can you tee things up just with a little bit of the background and how we got started on context and how we ended up here? Uh, I'll do a little, but mostly just kick it over to Victor. In the past, we've had various plugins that we've hidden <laughs> from most of the community because they were kind of dangerous. Um, and we have always had this kind of side desire to be able to run things somewhere else. And so, for the longest time, we had hacks of hacks to run things on the server side versus on the machine side. And so in this set of gyrations, it was getting annoying trying to keep track of that stuff. And we wanted a safer way to do that. And so the context is part is that safer way to do it, though. We're going to talk of danger zone here in a second and realize you can still do very bad things. Yeah, that's the one I'm going to demo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So realize that the idea is that when we talk of the generic term context, though it's going to get a little stranger, we've often always meant something running over on the machine. And everything that we've done task wise and all of that stuff have been consequences of running on the machine in that context over there. And we've had hacks like callback plugin is the plugin that does callbacks and the plugin that does um, endpoint exec. Those are ways for us to kind of initiate actions or do things on the, from the endpoint side opposed to the machine side. And so context is our solution to say, hey, we already have this task idea, let's extend that. So I'll kind of stop and I'll let Victor talk about the details of context and what the implementation is around that. And then maybe after we sh do some of that in a demo, um, we can talk about some of the envisioned uh, coolnesses that could come from this as we go forward. But I'll let Victor talk about more of the technical details of it. All right. All right. So let me go ahead and get my uh, screen shared. Let's see. This is the desktop that I want to share. So, so the basic idea of contexts is that uh, we want to be able to define a, uh, a way to run tasks in somewhere that isn't a machine. Um, we're not particularly concerned about where they run or how they run, but we need to be able to uh, define what happens. So I've added a new uh, top level item in DR provision called contexts. Spell it right. Okay, and a context 
define some mapping between a, a name, which is just uh, what we want to call the context, an engine, which is a plugin that meets uh, certain criteria, um, notably being able to uh, start and stop runners and uh, upload and manage images, and an image, which is uh, essentially um, a bundle of everything you need to be able to run uh, the, the derp CLI as an agent um, in a given execution context. Uh, that last bit is a little nebulous, and that is um, by definition, so that uh, we can implement contexts for things like uh, running inside of a container in Docker or Podman or in Kubernetes or running in a VM uh, that's out somewhere in a VMware ESXi cluster or out living on AWS or Google Cloud or whatever. Um, as, long as, you can, as long as you can provide an uh, image that uh, winds up running derp CLI with uh, a couple of uh, carefully chosen environment variables set, we can use it to run tasks outside of the context of a machine. This is the safety part. Yes. So I've got a couple of uh, contexts already defined on this system. Uh, the first one, or the safer one, is a little context called uh, minvrp. And that's just a little context that is essentially um, it's a Docker container that has DR provision that has a derp CLI in it, and when you uh, ask it to run tasks in it, it'll run those tasks using the derp CLI that's embedded. Um, the second one, and the one that I'm going to demo, and the one that's really dangerous, is called Danger Zone, and that is just um, derp CLI running on the DR provision endpoint with no safeties whatsoever and a propensity to lock up a lot. Um, it is used mostly as a uh, test harness. And uh, I would not, we, and we have not made the uh, source code for that one available yet. All right. I'm going to uh, pause and ask if there are any uh, questions at this point. Yeah, so Victor is just saying, um, we talk, we've, we've kind of talked about, there's a lot of danger stuff. And you know, we've had some colorful names for some of the previous um, iterations of the, the what has eventually become uh, the context system. Can you sort of just explain um, what it really is, what the danger really is? I mean, because it's sort of nebulous just calling it a danger zone. Can we define that a little better? Well, the danger is that uh, you're going to be running uh, tasks, you know, potentially arbitrary tasks that, uh, you know, can contain uh, scripts to do anything you want um, as whoever is running the DR provision server. Um, Needless to say, that's usually root. It usually has uh, full access to the entire system. So you could very easily run a task that does uh, rm-rf slash or you know, upload all my secret credentials to a botnet or whatever. The possibilities are endless. Um, that's why it's danger zone, because there are no guardrails. Um, and so and that's so what happens if someone submits a task that changes the boot M, for example? I'll get into that. Well, with regard to, to the danger zone part, that would change the boot env of the DRP endpoint. Well, no, no, it wouldn't work that way. No, no, for his, if you actually called it like the boot order, he said boot order. No, he said boot env. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, never mind. Boot env handling is its own thing uh, in the context of context, because I've made a couple of changes to how that works to make everything work. But uh, yeah, with Danger Zone, you can do anything arbitrarily bad to your uh, your provision endpoint, which is why it's mostly a test harness right now. Um, the one that, uh, I don't know if we've made it available yet, but the one that we're probably going to make available first is the, uh, the plugin that implements the uh, Docker contexts. Um, and that will work with uh, both uh, Docker and uh, Podman as a uh, container engine. And that will allow you to uh, run contexts in a container. And the nice thing about that is if your context needs to do something special, like uh, you know, reach out and do uh, out-of-band management things to a switch, 
or uh, manage uh, or provision volumes or manage a storage system or uh, you know go out and talk to your IPAM to uh, grab IP addresses. Um, it can do that. You just need to uh, make sure that uh, <clears throat> when you build an upload in the container, it has all the tools you need beforehand. And so that container, uh, is there any restrictions on where that container can run? Does it have to be hosted on the DRP endpoint? Can it be on a remote container management um, system? For this one, it has to be on the uh, DR provision endpoint. And uh, we provide uh, the plugins that uh, implement uh, context engines. Uh, they all conform to a specific API pattern that allows us to uh, upload and remove images and replace images and uh, check to see if an image that we need already exists. Um, it's designed to work in a completely, the current Docker context is designed to be able to work in a completely offline environment where you don't have access to the usual uh, container repositories like uh, hub.docker.io or quay.io or, you know, whatever one you're, you usually use for that sort of thing. Um, you know, the idea is, the idea is that we can use it in a completely firewalled environment and have complete control over what images are actually uh, uploaded into the container engine. As far as where that container engine runs, uh, for both, uh, for Podman, it kind of has to be on the local system. Podman doesn't have native uh, remote management capabilities. Um, for Docker, it can potentially be any Docker endpoint that you have access to. Uh, as long as you pass in the, uh, as long as it is configured to accept uh, connections uh, via HTTP, we can talk to it and run uh, containers on it. Cool. And so, does that mean in the future there might be the potential for uh, running them on a container orchestration system of some sort? Not naming names here, but uh, obviously, if it can do Docker remote, then there's a potential possibly for an orchestrated container management system so you can spread the load in large. Uh, yeah, enterprise environment. Kubernetes in this uh, in this conversation. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I was that, avoiding uh, saying the K word, but it's 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 ubiquitous in our industry. Um, yeah, that possibility is there. It wouldn't be with the Docker context specifically because there are uh, different requirements for um, launching. Uh, well, essentially, a different interface for launching and managing containers and images versus uh, just the native uh, Docker stuff. Um, and so there's that. All right. Let's see. Any questions from uh, Kat or Patrick? Ooh, we've got another person. Or anyone else at this point? If not, I will go ahead and uh, jump into the demo and uh, hope it won't explode. Done it this time. Which is done about half the times I've tried it this morning. If there are no other questions, I will go ahead and uh, jump into the demo. So what I'm going to be doing for this demo is I've got a machine floating out here that I use for all my test purposes called Test AMD64. And it's just a VM running. It's just a VM that's currently just booted into a sledgehammer sitting there waiting. And I'm going to demonstrate some uh, features of how contexts work using it. So I've created a new workflow named zone of danger because it's going to wind up running tasks in the danger zone context. Um, so in the zone of danger stage, we've got several tasks going. Uh, the first one is just going to be go high and that's just, uh, that's just going to be running go high in the context of the runner that's uh, running on this VM. Then what we're going to do is we're going to set the context to the danger zone context, which is going to uh, fire up a new uh, danger zone, uh, a new instance of uh, the danger zone agent, which I've uh, got its log file sitting in this window. And at the same time, we're going to switch the boot environment of the VM to local. And that's going to cause this VM to reboot and go to the local disk. However, since we're still going to be in the danger zone context, Danger Zone is going to run Go High on itself and uh, save uh, the information that it gathers back to uh, 
back to the machine we're going to run it on. And then it's going to, and then the danger zone is going to switch context back to the blank, to the empty context, which is a shorthand for whatever runner is running on the machine. And when the machine finishes uh, rebooting to the local disk, it's going to pick up and run go high again. And this uh, VM is deliberately set up to take a long time booting to disk, so we'll be able to see um, what the go high did on the machine is um, both before and after we run through this process. So just to start with, let's go back so, into the machine. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that Chris uh, had a question in chat on uh, immutable snowflake question mark. Uh, this allows better lockdown of the node as nothing really gets configured on the node. Immutable snowflake. I didn't even see that. <laughs> and there's a little snowflake for the container. The oh, context change. oh, no, no, no. Uh, sorry. In the tab, and yeah, let me workflows. Zone of danger. Zone of danger. The snowflake here you're talking about? I think that's what he's referencing, yeah. Yeah. The, Just reading his uh, chat. message there. Oh, so Chris, the reason that this is done, uh, while we're talking about it in this context of running some things in one location versus the other, so yeah, that is one of the use cases is that I might choose to have a task that needs to have certain credentials that I don't want actually to make it to the machine. So I'm going to run it in a context on the endpoint, or I might have it choose to talk to some networking services or external services that aren't um, available directly from the machine. So for security reasons, I've restricted those infrastructure services to only come from the endpoint versus from the um, machines themselves. So then I could use the context for that. Um, so that kind of talks about that path, but there's many, 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 many more that we'll talk about here in a bit. Yeah, uh, my favorite go-to example for that sort of thing is um, say you're running in an environment where you have uh, some form of hard isolation between your provisioning network and your production network, um, such that in order to uh, make the machine to split the machine from talking on the provision network to the, to the production network, you have to go and configure this switch to change the uh, default VLAN mappings for the port. That is nigh impossible to write a task for if it has to run on the machine because it's guaranteed to lose network connectivity during the process. However, if you want to uh, make that task happen in the middle of a, while running a context, it's pretty easy just to uh, arrange for the machine to uh, reboot, jump over into a different context that uh, has the ability to make the switch mappings, and go in and uh, call whatever services or APIs you need to reprogram the switch while the machine's in the middle of rebooting. And when it comes back up, it'll be on the right network. That's sort of my favorite uh, go-to scenario inspired by, uh, you know, things that I've uh, had to work around in a past life. But anyways, back to the demo. So I've got this machine, my test AMD 64 box. And I'm going to flip the workflow that it's currently running from Discover Base over into uh, Zone of danger. Well, before I do that, let me uh, go in, look at the Go High inventory. And you can see that uh, right now, it thinks that the BIOS the system is running is the EFI development kit 2 slash OVMF BIOS, which is correct in this case because uh, this VM is configured to boot using UFI. So, but now, Move over to zone of danger. Uh, I 
it failed somehow. Oh, nope, there we go. OK, and it's plowed through. It looks like it has finished running the Zone of Danger Go High. So let's take a look at the current status. OK, so it's flipping the context back and go to the machine. And we take a look at it now. All right. Now it thinks the BIOS vendor is Dell, which is correct because I'm running this demo on a Dell laptop. Oh, and now it's going to take forever to reboot into the disk, but it'll get there eventually. And so that was my very, very fast demo of uh, <laughs> running tasks in the danger zone context. Uh, it didn't explode like it does about half the time, and that's because Danger Zone is a, a, a dirty hack. <laughs> yeah. That I don't put much effort into uh, making run perfectly. And so as far as the demo goes, unless we want to see something else that is uh, more or less it, once this thing uh, finishes booting back into disk, we can uh, reset it and try again. Or I can uh, maybe show off something running inside of uh, MintDRP, although uh, you know we're just begging for bad interference from the demo gods there. Hey, Victor, this is Mike. Um, hey, Mike. Can you can you walk us through kind of setting that up? Uh, setting what up? This demo? Well, no. The uh, like install the plugin, and then is it is there some configuration that that is required after that? Anything like that? For the Danger Zone plugin, no, there's no configuration required. Um, for the oh, let me pop up chat here, for the uh, Docker context plugin, um, you do have to upload individual uh, images that you need to make the contexts work. So, for instance. Yeah, Patrick had to go away. Yeah. Okay. So for instance, on um, <clears throat> on this system, I have the MinDRP plugin. So let's see. So I think part of uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, what did I name it? Oh, Docker yeah. context. Yeah. Okay, so right now I've got Docker context on the system configured to uh, run using Docker. And so the only parameter that it requires is the Unix socket that we want to eventually talk to Docker on. Um, so let's see. Actually, that may be out of date. Let's see. Yeah, I don't have Docker installed here. It's, just, it's actually using Podman, so. So on the system, I've got uh, the MinDRP latest image set up. In order to get that on the system, well, I had to create a little image for it called MinDRP. And unfortunately, I don't have a good way to show the plugin actions for this. Let's see. Hmm. Oh. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, because we validate. Yeah, because we validate, and they all take a. Yep. Let's see. Do we have? 
yeah, we need to fix that part. Because I have to remember what the name of the uh, parameters that I need are every time. For, for background, everybody on the uh, meetup here, uh, context is all of, what, two weeks old? Yeah. Two weeks old. We've had some various pieces and parts laying around in different forms, but for the most part, context itself has required some surgery in the platform to support different contexts. And uh, it will probably be a couple more weeks of getting things cleaned up and sorted out and use cases nailed down before it's super solid, but it's very promising. Um, I had a, a question. This, you know, to me, feels like we've replicated or are building essentially a, a function as a service sort of solution. We've always had, um, I'm not sure what the right word is for it, I guess a configuration management or, it, or I guess it's already sort of function as a service with tasks serving as the functions in the uh, workflow uh, job runner on the DRP endpoint side, firing off tasks and jobs in, in a distributed manner. Uh, but this brings us uh, even more closer, I think, to sort of a function as a service solution. Um, I hate to think of it in terms like that, actually. So mostly because it's not general. Yeah, so this is one of the kind of interesting enhancement feature things, right? So in some regards, the context as we've kind of base described it so far is just an extension of doing something on behalf of that machine, right? And so in this case, even when it hopped over, it still thinks and operates as if it's doing that machine. Now, when we talk about things like, hey, could I go change switch ports and stuff like that, right? We're building a task that's still taking actions on behalf of that machine, maybe against a switch. Now, the next level up function, and Shane, I'll get to where you're going here in a second, is say I have to manage something in my data center that I will never run code on. So like a storage system that's an appliance or um, a switch, right? That doesn't necessarily have the ability to run a DRPC CLI runner. Um, you could now create a machine object and set its context to a container either like min uh, DRP min or min DRP, I think is what you called it, as yeah. an example. And then now I have a context that I can take actions for that system, right? But it's still conceptually, I, you know, around the machine. Now in this case, the machine might be a switch, right? Or you could envision potentially take, for example, a solid fire system. And you could build a context that treats that appliance as a machine to let you drive tasks and operations against it. All right, so that's great. So now if I'm creating arbitrary machines for things, my machines can be virtual. That means they can be anything. So now we can get to start approaching to some of the things that Shane's talking about, where I might choose to have a functional thing I need to do across some subset of my data center, or I want to define some kind of action. Well, and we're not necessarily recommending this yet, but it's an area to explore, is that you could build a temporary machine that represents the transient action you want to do. Assign it a workflow, that you vetted and have it track and keep track of that workflows, actions and state and results and jobs. And you'll even get jobs and events relative to that transient kind of thing. And so there now you really are getting closer and closer to functions and actions as a service. I think the intermediate step that we could start seeing is, and we're not gonna do this immediately, but take crib, for example. Crib right now builds a cluster and it does so by kind of manipulating a bunch of machines through and uses that profile, the crib cluster profile as a way to provide aggregated control points. Well, with context, I can now define a set of workflow based actions I could do 
to a cluster and represent that cluster as an object in the system that could have its own state, its own control points, right? And the idea there is I could say like drain cluster or create cluster or add to cluster or remove from cluster or um, rolling upgrade cluster. And the idea is I could build workflows that have our normal task structure that could run from a location that could do the right things, right? Which may trigger other workflows on machines, right? And then be able to do the sequencing across that. So instead of having it kind of sequenced hidden inside of this profile object inside of all the machines at once, you now kind of have a first order object that's tracking that cluster state and all those parameters and all that stuff, you get the full richness of that, right? And to me, the next, as we go beyond that, that's where we can actually start talking about though, again, I think Victor and I are a little more leery of it than Shane, of the idea of function as a service where that function might be some data center function that you're gonna do as an intermediate action and get a result, right? Um, but it becomes possible. I mean, the building block is then, is then there. Now, you know, a future enhancement may be that machines don't stay machines, right? We may have some concept of machines with some newer concept of thing. I don't know, right? Thingy. That's why I'm leery of this like, whole thing. That's, that's why I'm leery of uh, calling this function as a service because it's right now it's more, uh, you know, place to run tasks on behalf of machines mm -hmm. or whatever you're counting as a machine. Yeah. And we start to get uh, more general than that. And uh, we start to kind of lose focus as to what our core mission is. Oh, I guess from my perspective, as we discuss this a little bit, I think it will be obvious and required to do things like clusters and clusters will be an obvious extension. Now, odds are we'll create a object on top of outside of machines or something for clusters because we're getting lots of feedback from the, our customer sets and community that clusters need high order management functions. And there's some that we should be able to control through that process. And they're cross machines and all that stuff. And I think that's uh, the first step to the beyond. And whether we go much beyond that, yeah, we'll see. But I think that's the the main first step, right? Because as we play with like, you've been tracking our ESXi stuff, right? The next thing would be to build a, a vCenter cluster out of that and track some of that and be able to control some of those vCenter actions um, through a set of workflows. Um, and the same so with some interesting things. Yeah, yeah. Some interesting things that all of this opens up and enables uh, for the platform to be able to move in other more flexible directions, whether we want to call it function as a service or sort of a generic uh, proxy capability to run commands in proxy for something else uh, that can't be executed directly. It also, I think, uh, helps with a security model where we were using plugins to execute actions on the DRP machine side because machines in some places and some customers couldn't run and execute uh, or reach certain infrastructure elements from the machine uh, provisioning subnet. So this uh, helps open up and make the barrier to entry to what plugins did uh, a bit easier since you can have arbitrary, uh, thinking about the container solution, you know, arbitrary containers that do specific things or have specific uh, capabilities in them. You know, a strong example we kicked around uh, and briefly mentioned on uh, the meetup here we chatted a little bit also in the, the messaging is uh, Napalm, which is a Python library for managing switches. And we've always had a strong uh, desire and a lot of asks around managing switches. We just didn't have a good path for doing that really without building a huge complex plugin that's hard to maintain. Um, Napalm gives us that huge library of flexibility and multi-switch uh, vendor control. And it may not be the right tool, but it's a good uh, option that we're sort of looking at to be able to execute, you know, all the way from complex switch configuration for top of racks. And now you have a top of racks set of switches and machines and uh, that you can orchestrate as units or individually or simple actions, just like 
switch port configurations for a machine as the machine transitions through different life cycles or use cases or you know from provisioning subnets to uh, production networks you know those sorts of things uh, being able to do operational flows where if you want to be able to add uh, additional VLANs or VXLAN uh, VTAPs for um, enabling certain network traffic. Now, all of these things sort of open up, and, the, and there's just a whole world of things that open up with a capability. Um, it's pretty cool, and a lot of people start latching on to interesting ideas. We're really looking forward to uh, what the community um, wants to drive us to do with this, and also what our customers are driving us to do with this. It's pretty cool capability that really just up levels an already pretty kick kick butt platform solution. Sorry that was a rant. I didn't mean to go on a rant. <laughs> You're good. No problem. <laughs> uh, Victor, did you have more you wanted to show us there with the demo now that the machine's booted in and we've stopped ranting? Uh not particularly. Um <laughs> A lot of the more interesting stuff that I've been doing with contexts I can't talk about yet. <laughs> so, should be soon. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, the doc, so contexts, uh, they're out there in the v4.1.0 uh, beta release. Um, and documentation is uh, forthcoming. Um, once that's in place, um, we will be working on methods on, uh, you know, figuring out methods of uh, streamlining how you use uh, and manage contexts in terms of uh, multi-site management and that sort of thing. I know Greg and I haven't had much discussion along the way, along those lines yet, but we need to sit down and uh, start talking about it now that the, uh, at least the initial implementation is uh, mostly nailed down. So, um, other than that, that's pretty much it for uh, contexts right now. I'll probably talk about them uh, more uh, in a later meetup as uh, we develop and get closer to making them generally available. Okay, excellent. Uh, Greg, Victor, thank you very much for all of your info. Was there any other questions from community that we could cover before we wrap up? No questions. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, appreciate all of your participation. Uh, we're really looking forward to uh, polishing up, finishing, documenting, and all of the fun things that uh, make context the final product. And uh, in the next uh, meetup or three, we'll uh, revisit the topic when we have uh, more to talk about it, more use cases around it, and some more of the features uh, finished up on it. In the meantime, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Greg. Thank you, Victor, uh, for uh, your input and, and information and demo on context. Uh, that wraps up uh, version 44 of Digital Ready Bar Provision Meetup. Thank you, everyone. All right.